Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. A very important subject that really need, I need a really strong drink for this one. Um, <clears throat> does everybody know what this is? Mm. In just about a year's time, you will need that when you enter Dutch right. public transportation, and we will know all about you. But this is even cooler. Everybody knows what this is, right? <laughs> this is a passport with RFID. It's the first passport that would make travel a lot faster. It is the first passport that ever got me rejected into the United States. It took me four and a half hours of talking, explaining that this was a valid passport and that they really could let me in and ultimately they would let me in. So I understood that Carsten and Hendrik know all about how to reverse engineer and explain how this all works. So my question to you guys is, take the floor and please explain this to us so that we know how this and this works. Thanks a lot. It's great to see so many of you out for the, I believe, last talk of the night, at least the last before the Seabase party. Um, I'll be presenting weaknesses that we found while reverse engineering the MyFair security system for RFIDs, a project that I've been doing with Starbuck and Hendrik. Let me begin with an observation. Everybody in this room owns several RFID tags, and many of you even ca carry them with you every day. RFID tags are tiny computer chips um, that, whose whole purpose is identification. So when queried, these, these passively powered tags reply with, with their identity. And they come in all kinds of um, forms and shapes. You, you find them as, as um, stickers, labels. You find them in, in, in car keys. You, you'll find them in passports and all these various applications. And we, we, see, we see RFID tags becoming more and more ubiquitous. Um, we, last year, RFID tags were used in, in the World Cup tickets. We see them in access control to buildings in payment systems. Many metro subway systems use RFID tags now as a wireless means of payment. We see them as, as theft protection in, in cars. And that has been a trend for, for many years. Um, they, they spread into more and more applications, including the passport that we've seen, but also human implants, where people embed an RFID tag underneath their skin again, for means of identification. And the, the general trend that we observe is that RFID tags replace traditional identifiers, including PIN numbers, passwords, even biometrics, or a car key. You can buy a car now without the physical key that, where, you, where you only have an, a computerized identifier to, to grant you access to your car. And for all these applications, the, 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 the identification itself isn't enough yet. We, we need some, some level of authentication, some security that has yet to be added to, to many of these applications, especially the, the, the implementable ones that are very easily clonable. Another trend that, that has been observed for, for many years now already is that, um, welcome Starbuck, <laughs> that more and more products are tagged with RFID tags, and companies including Walmart um, demand in a few years from now all their products to be tagged with RFID tags, so they will virtually replace barcodes in, in most every application that barcode and consumer products is used today, which many of, of you are, I'm sure, aware of um, imposes threats to, to customer privacy. If, if Walmart can track their products within the store, once you purchase them, they can track you on the street. And not only Walmart can, but virtually everybody with a $50 reading device can. Another privacy implication of this technology is that, that competitors, say Walmart and Target, they can spy on each other, walk through each other's stores, and, and see the, the turnover of goods. So privacy goes both ways. And 
besides security, the, the implants and the passports, privacy is probably the, the, the best motivation for security on an RFID tech. Well, to, to privacy, people came up with all kinds of breaking, jamming, shielding solutions. But as, as researchers, we'd like to see more sophisticated and more fashionable solutions to this problem. <laughs> so in, in a nutshell, we, we need crypto on these, these tags to, to, uh, to, to guarantee unclonability of, for example, medication. The Federal Drug Administration in, in the US demands your RFID tags to be embedded in, in medication so that you can't copy or counterfeit a, a bottle of medication, but then you want it to be unclonable. Um, you also want it to be private, obviously, so that nobody knows what medication you're actually carrying. And for all this, we, we need crypto, but we as academics don't actually have any crypto that we know would fit on an RFID tag. And the the, the, the gap that we see, but um, the, the tags that we see in the market um, either have, have no crypto whatsoever, they're just easily clonable and have been cloned often, or they, they are um, security overkill almost, um, including the passport, where the, the, tech, the, the chip itself, from what I hear, costs $20, so you don't want to put that on a box at Walmart or break your business model. Mostly, uh, but even if if um, if money wasn't an issue, the embedding crypto, good crypto, on an RFID tag increases its size, obviously, and and so it needs more power to be operated. And all this power is harvested from the reader through the, the wireless link. And the more power you need, the closer you have to to go to the reader. So even if money isn't an issue, you can't actually use good crypto on the RFID tag in applications that, that need reading ranges above the, the one inch or whatever the, the passports can be read in. Um, academics has come up with, with few solutions or at least improvements. Um, Feldhof and Volkesdorfer from Graz, they proposed um, AES to be, to be integrated in RFID text, which certainly is an improvement, but still in, in, in would, would bump up the, the cost of a tech many times. And then what we see in the market is my fan, similar solutions made by Philips or NXP, what they call themselves today, um, that implement some form of crypto and, and Philips won't tell us what they do. And seeing this mismatch that, that academics can't find anything that they could implement and Philips sells something that they claim has approved authentication which probably just means it hasn't been broken for eight years that it has been in the market and might not be approved by tonight anymore. Um, and advanced security levels where that already is a contradiction with the 48-bit key that they use. <laughs> um, we, we do, however, see in the market that these RFID tags have an impact, a, sec a security improving impact in that cars, the, the number of stolen cars, for example, does go down um, as more and more of, of these RFID tags are integrated into car keys. So th there might be some benefit to it, at least people with some financial benefit, car thieves haven't majorly broken it yet. Um, and and th this whole question, what did they do, what, did, they, did they actually find something that academia couldn't let us to, to start this project where we look at the MIFA and try to reverse engineer the, the security of it and then as a second step evaluate whether that security is actually good enough. And we, we tackle this problem from two directions. We, we do look at the, the actual chip, the actual chip that Philip sells to us and everybody else that implements this crypto. And then at the same time, um, we, we take the ambiguity out of many of the observations that we have through observing communication between the Philips chip and the, the Philips um, reading device. That, that also implements this crypto. And I, I'll briefly talk about um, the, the second point, just so that you have an idea of what we did there, but Henrik will later talk a little bit more about the, the possibilities that we exploited here. We, we do use, um, as, as our hardware base, the OpenPCD, thanks to Milos Meriak and Harald Felter, an open source RFID reading device that 
that actually does integrate this, this Philips reading chip that, that speaks the crypto uh, of MyFair. But it does only so through a microcontroller that, that relays all the commands to the RFID tag and back, which gives us tremendous control over all the timing. And, and we could, haven't done so yet, but in theory, even change data on the fly. So a tremendously useful tool to, for, for crypto research. Um, back to the RFID tag. That, that's a photo of the, of the MyFair tag. Um, is about a square millimeter, so a, a tiny piece of silicon. And we, we etched away a little, a little oh, gap over here. And zooming in in here, we, we see the different metal layers um, coming in here. And, and you, you, you probably get an, an idea about the dimensions. And these different metal layers then interconnect the transistors that, that are even below. Well, what we did now is we sliced off layers of this chip and took photos. And <laughs> that's what these photos look like. <laughs> we, have, we have five layers of just interconnect, metal layers, connecting what is on the lowest level, which are the, the functional blocks. So each of of these little blocks encode some, some AND gate or an OR gate, maybe a flip-flop, any, any of, of those. And, and so the, the, the remaining five layers are just so that those are connected to one another. And in theory, by just looking at this long enough, you would know what, what uh, it does. Well, it took, took us a while, but we... <laughs> the, um, the, the process that we went through to to, to, to reverse engineer the functionality from just these pictures now um, started by deciding that we couldn't actually, I'll, I'll go back one slide for a second, couldn't actually um, look at all these, there's about, there are about 10,000 of, of these small building blocks and we couldn't look at every single one of them. So we wanted to categorize them a little bit before we, we start analyzing. And, uh, we, we observed that there aren't actually 10,000 different ones. They're all taken from a library of cells, and there's only about 70 different types of gates, and we ended up writing MATLAB scripts that once we select one instance of, of a gate, finds all, all the other ones. We, we use um, computer vision techniques, template matching based on normalized cross-correlation, Whoever's interested in that, come talk to me later. Um, we we did automate this whole process and then had a had a map of 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 functional building blocks on 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 the chip and and now in the second step had to decide where to focus our attention where we we couldn't actually analyze the con connectivity between all these 10,000 different ones. And we, we, an we did analyze about 15%, which is still a lot of work, and the crypto is only about 10, but we, we were able to narrow it down quite a bit. Um, what we did to, to, to find the important pieces of the chip is we just looked for crypto-like blocks, long strings of flip-flops that would in implement a register, XORs that are virtually never used in, in control logic. We looked for, for um, building blocks more on the, the edge of the chip, sparsely connected to the rest, but heavily connected to one another. So that's where we ended up finding the crypto. And then once we limited it down to, to these corners, we, we, we went in with the images and, and had to, from the the, the, the gates and the interconnectivity then reconstruct the circuit from which we, we then read the, the functionality. Very painful process, did a lot of errors. Fortunately, the, there's, there's some safety nets. If you, if you see two outputs being connected to one another, that can't be. If you, if you see the very structured crypto to have some, some, some variations somewhere, we, we looked again and we usually found an error that we made. We will, if we ever look at another chip, automate this process too, <laughs> to, to get rid of this, this painful manual uh, work. But enough said, this is overview of the crypto as implemented in the MyFair tags. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
we purposely omit many details from this slide. This is the first public announcement that the, the crypto cipher, uh, the, the crypto one cipher on the MIFA tag is known, and we will give out further details at some point next year. So if you, if you do rely on MIFA security for anything, start migrating. <laughs> At, at the core of the cipher, we have a 48-bit, one 48-bit shift register. Shift register where in every clock, all the bits are shifted to the right, and then um, a, a linear combination of bits, an XOR, is shifted at the first bit position, a pseudo-random number generator. At the same time, um, a binary function with high degree um, generates a key stream, one bit at a time out of this. Um, to, to, to initialize this, this to, to a, a known state between the reader and the tag, um, random numbers are used both from the, the reading device, so that the reader has some, some kind of, of random number generator, and um, also an external um, random number is used. That is combined with the, the secret key, the tag ID, to, to, to get all the, the crypto properties that you need to, to make a stream cipher um, secure against replay attacks. I'll, for the rest of the talk, only talk about some, some, some weaknesses that we found. I won't go into further detail here, but as I said, more to be expected later next year. Um, first thing we look at is the, the random number generator, and we, we couldn't believe that. It, it's a 16-bit random number generator. Th these numbers are blown up to 32 bits, but they have a 16-bit seed, so there's only 65,000 different ones. If you had looked at, at enough transactions, you'd probably have noticed that too. Um, if that's not weak enough yet, <laughs> the value of the, the, the random number that is generated, the value depends only on, on the time between powering up the tag and challenging it, and from what I said earlier, we have complete control over the timing. So we, we were able to make the tag generate the same random number again and again and again in every transaction. <laughs> One might maybe start arguing that on an RFID tag with all these constraints, you, you'd have to, to, to sacrifice something like the, the, the randomness of the numbers. We saw the same behavior on the reader. The reading device also implements a random number generator that we can make generate the same number over and over and over again. So we have a crypto protocol where all the randomness is controlled about, by, by us, by the attacker, which completely breaks the security. Depending on the, on the application, that might still be okay. Controlling the, the, the timing would require it to be in the car, to break the car, in which case you don't want to break it anymore. So some applications might still be okay with this, but this, this is cryptographically a major flaw. I, want, uh, I, I didn't want to give out the exact details of this random number generator, but I figured since it's, it's a linear feedback shift registers, people would probably go to Wikipedia and just look it up, what, what it is and what it could be, and, oh, there it is, that's a... <laughs> well, I'm not sure who copied from whom. <laughs> um, Besides the random number generator, there are other weaknesses in the cipher. We, um, we, we didn't find anything nonlinear in the whole system, which means if you, if you have one state of this, this register, you can, as intended, go forward steps, but you can also go backwards. So if, if, you, if you break any of it at any point, see weak bits, you can go back to the session key and even go back to the master key. Major weakness, too. We, we see this this binary function has some cryptographic weaknesses, which, which suggests to us we haven't actually tried attacking it through this avenue. Um, a, a key finding attack that would run in, in sub-exponential time. But maybe we don't even have to go there. Why not just do brute force? 
th this isn't actually a system that we implemented. This is from, from a similar project that John Hopkins, where they broke um, a related product. But we, we did start implementing the cipher. It, the cipher is meant to be small, extremely small, small enough to fit in our RFID tag. So we can fit many of those on an, on an FPGA. And we, we estimate that with our implementation, it can certainly be improved upon. Um, we'd need one week to break a key on, on a $100 device, or one day on a $700 device, or an hour on a $17,000 device. And if you're in the business of, say, car theft, that might <laughs> pay off quickly. <laughs> you, <laughs> Um, again, more to, of this to be expected next year. Um, <laughs> so in, in a nutshell, the, the, MIFA, the, the MIFA crypto is flawed in many ways and its security is, as expected, not even close to anything what we would want for, for good application. For, for, some, for some small value transactions, this might still be okay. In particular, I'm thinking about privacy here, where an attacker really only gains a large enough advantage from a large number of transactions, and if breaking each of those costs you a few cents, maybe the attack is broken. But for pretty much anything else, this shouldn't be used. What we learned from, from this project is that obscurity, well, what we see again from this project is that obscurity doesn't actually add any, any security. If, if anything, it, it hurts you in the long run, because once it is leaked, weaknesses are discovered that would before have been discovered in a peer review process, at least I believe so. We, we saw several weaknesses that, that can be fixed really easily without any cost over it. The, the random number generator, for example, just by using a different type of flip-flop that is already found on the, on, the, on the tech and other places, you could improve the randomness a lot. So obscurity for security, again, doesn't work. We are left with the, the question, though, um, what, what crypto can be implemented on our FD tags? And, and from knowing that nothing that we have so far, even, even block ciphers that are very small, hash functions, too big still, can't be implemented. We're, we're really left with the question, what, what, where can we sacrifice some cryptographic properties to make it fit on an RFID tag. And that, that really will be left open for, for a while, I believe, but will, ha will need to be solved before the, these RFID systems are deployed in all these various applications and will replace passwords, pins, and biometrics. Well, I was much faster than I expected, but I'd say we, we take a few questions now, and then Henrik will We'll talk about some juicy details of what we actually did. Thanks a lot. Yeah, what, what hardware did you use to make the photographies of the chip? Starbuck, do you want to answer that? Can we get a microphone here? It was a normal um, 500 uh, magnification microscope, an optical one. Yeah, and to take uh, the slices? Uh, to the slices? Um, we use a, um, a polisher with um, 0.04 micron um, polishing paste. Okay. <laughs> so, so normally... Uh, uh, oh, oh. So it's, it's, it's really straightforward. So normally you can use a... Um, dot three micron um, polishing foil you can um, you you will find on each um, optical lab um, to polish um, um, fiber connectors, so you can do it at home if you have a microscope around yeah. 500 magnification. And how much uh, does uh, all the photography cost? Yeah, what? How much did uh, taking all the photo cost? Uh, I, I don't understand you. Sorry. Uh, what was your budget for taking the photographs? Um, I guess um, you can get a 500 magnification microscope for around um, one, uh, 1,000 euros at, uh, at eBay. Okay. So it, it's really, you can do it in your kitchen <laughs> if you want. Yeah, okay. 
<laughs> but but you, you do you you do see the the dimensions in which we work, right? This is this is a scale of ten micro. So this this is less less than a micron apart. You have to polish really really softly. <laughs> <laughs> More questions? Can we get a microphone? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I read somewhere that uh, the crypto was based on triple this. Do you yeah. have any idea where that rumor That's came from? The, the, the MyFair family of techs goes beyond what we looked at. That the successes of this Crypto One tech or MyFair Classic that implements triple this, yes. And Philips will probably help you migrate away from this to their own product. That's a common mix-up that I read often when I Google for Crypto One that some guys uh, pretend or say that it was based on triple death. They are pr obviously mixing it up with the Deathfire cards that are the successors to these cards and have proper triple death implemented in them. Oh, well, it passes. Uh, um, allegedly, you can use a standard triple death implementation on the host side. So. It should pass the standard tests and should work as well as any other triple test implementation. These tags, after all, are t 10 years old. At least the, the first ones were built 10 years ago. So the, the VLSI technology has scaled tremendously to, to allow for more and more crypto. But um, to, to answer the question of the origin of this, we, we, we haven't found anything even close to this in, by design. This is a stream cipher used in a challenge response protocol. There's nothing similar out there. So it's, it's a completely uh, self-engineered Philips thing. Hmm? There's a question far in the back. Yeah, and the question here in oh, front sorry. is uh, what first. Is the ran random number generator only on the host? Is it not on, it's not actually on the RFID itself? It, it is on the RFID itself. You, you, want, you want to have two sources of randomness so that, that either, either party could be an attacker and it would still have some randomness. So there's an, a random number generated on both sides. So they, they've both got the same thing and they're exchanging mutually. They, um, the, the, the one I've shown, the one on Wikipedia, that is only on, on, the, on the tag. But the, the weakness that you can control the random number through timing, that you'll find on both sides, yes. Excellent, thank you. I'm looking forward to free tube fairs next year. <laughs> <laughs> well, get an get a open PCD, get involved in that. I, I'm sure we can, we can give you the, the, the firmware that allows mm -hmm. to, to get the same random numbers. Mm -hmm. A question in the back and then in the front. So for controlling the timing, what's the resolution in time that you can measure? What, what is the resolution to, to break the random number generator? Well, what's the possible resolution in time that you can simulate? Like, the, how, how precise is the timing? I will talk about that later, but the random, genom, random number generator is clocked uh, with one clock every 9.44 microseconds. That's the bit clock of the ISO 14403. And I think we can measure with about 10 nanosecond resolution. We have a logic analyzer. I will talk about that later. And for generation of signals, our precision should be below one microsecond. I had some problems <laughs> with that lately, but I think I can be in the area of about 500 nanoseconds. That's fucking awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, it would be better if I was below 100 nanoseconds. I'm not <laughs> quite there yet. Question in the front. Uh, I have another question. Uh, when these type of cards are used for uh, like passage systems or uh, for the subway ticket fare or something, uh, do they use unique keys per card or is it the global keys for all of the cards? The Interesting question. Uh, we'll have to find that out when we are able to break the keys. If, if um, they're de deployed well, then they would use sev several. Uh, they would mm -hmm. use different keys for different they're, cards. There is a trade-off here because um, the Philips Reader IC has an internal storage for about up to 32 keys, which can't be read out, which is not quite secure memory, but secure enough. So you can store up to 33 keys in the Reader IC and then use these keys, 
or you could generate the key based on some master secret in a microcontroller, but then you have to transmit the key over the bus to the reader IC, so it can be sniffed on the bus. So you have a trade-off of whether you want to store 32, 32 keys in the IC or want to transmit them in the clear over the bus. Okay, I see we don't have any more questions. Then, oh, question in the back. Um, some access control system based on MyFair um, only reads the uh, ID of the MyFair card and then um, they say you can get in or you cannot get in. Is it possible with the uh, open PCD to the copy that ID and... Not with the open PCD but with the open PICC which is the sister project for a card emulator. I originally planned to present that at this uh, Congress, but I didn't quite get it working because of the timing issues I mentioned earlier. To get that properly working, I need to have a jitter below, uh, approximately below 100 nanoseconds, and I'm not quite there yet. But in principle, the unique identifier that is transmitted at the start of transaction is not encrypted and not secured in any way. I'll have something about that too in just a second or two. But we will emulate the tag, mm -hmm. yes. And there is a second, uh, there's one unique identifier that's transmitted at the start of transaction in the anti-collision procedure, and the unique identifier is stored on the card in the memory of the card, and you can read it from the card. That you can't uh, spoof with this technique, with just proof, uh, spoofing the transmitted anti-collision identifier, but you can probably, or I will show you, you can probably spoof it uh, through some other measures I'll present shortly. But, okay. but to answer the part of your question about systems that rely solely on the unique ID of the card, that's what Philips calls basic security levels. Mm -hmm. No security level at all. But as long as you, you don't have um, a VLSI fab, you can't actually copy a tag and make another tag that has the exact functionality and the same random number. So there is some security. But in any application where you could just as well bring in some, some, some device hidden underneath your clothes or any of that, where you don't actually have to have it to be an RFID tag. You can easily spoof the unique ID. That's um, the open PICC. Looks just like uh, Milos presented at, at, at last year's Congress. Lo has about the same format as the standard card and can, in theory, implement and send any unique identifier that you want. I'll have that now. Okay, for the um, um, for our um, in order to be able to play around with timing or to analyze the protocol in any way at all, we needed to be able to sniff the communication to verify our findings of the circuit. And the sniffing setup, I think we shortly described it at the uh, camp this year, um, consists of the open PCD reader, or you, in principle you can use any um, reader that's based on the same reader IC, and uh, an open PICC card emulator. Because the cool thing of these is, is that the reader can be set up so that it will output the signal that it received from the card on some digital output, the reader outputs the card signal, and you can set up the card, or it's set up by default, so that it will output the signal that it received from the reader on a digital output. The card outputs the reader signal. That's what you have here. The reader sends something to the MyFair card, and because this is radio, it's also received by our OpenPICC, and sound sent out through a digital output, and the MyFair card answers, which is received by the reader and output through a digital output. Then Milos has, has a cute little logic analyzer that you can connect to a universal serial bus and it can capture several thousand or hundred thousand samples with 10 nanosecond resolution, which we just connect to these, both of these signals and then we get the reader to card and card to reader communication crystal clear uh, just as it was transmitted over the air 
without any interference and uh, no analog signal processing whatsoever. Uh, don't worry about that. The uh, signal here is mirrored here and just ignore that one. I did that in my encoder decoder. Yeah, the signal here is not, not the real data signal. Uh, it's not the data, it's not 011010, but it's the actually the module, um, the encoded signal. So this is from reader to card is Miller coded, and from card to reader is Manchester coded. But that's easy to decode, and uh, we have a decoder that will just take the output from the logic analyzer and give us the frames that were transmitted in both directions. Two ray sniffing. Um, question? Mm, micros in the back. Mm -hmm. So if I, if I can actually intercept the communication on the radio channel between the card and the, the writer, when the writer is actually writing to the card, I can then brute force the key within a week and then write myself to the card, or write the stuff myself to this card. Yeah, should be possible. As so it's, it's a simple brute forcing. As soon as you know the algorithm, you can brute force implement it outside of the card because the card will only deal about a twice per second, and if you can brute force it in an FPGA, you can brute force it as fast as you want, and then 48 bits is not enough. There's a lot of things that's going to change. <laughs> <laughs> Start migrating. Start migrating. <laughs> uh, there is some dependency to the implementation because you can specify a different uh, password uh, uh, depending on uh, access level. So it okay. could be in theory there is a different key that you don't see. Okay, writing. yeah, the MyFest system knows it has two keys per sector, and the, the two keys can be assigned different rights. You can have write rights and read rights, and, uh, but I'll show you something neat about these in about three minutes. You will be surprised. I was. Okay, um, and that's the timing setup that I have. You have the open PLCC down here. You have just about any MyFair card in the middle and the open, that's the open PCD and the open PICC up here. That's the digital output from the signal that was received from the reader, and that's the digital output that was received from the card. And Milos made me a neat cable, which has just a standard mini USB cable, which has a power switch in the power line, so I don't have to plug in and plug out the USB cable all the time. And um, on the open PCD, I had firmware running that was originally written by Harald um, that I modified so that it will just uh, start authenticating and reading as soon as it's powered on. Oh, I think that's the original function and I have only uh, some output. And what I then did is, uh, seen that? what I then did is um, turn everything off, start capturing on the logic analyzer, switch on the power to the PCD. The PCD will boot its firmware. The firmware will automatically start uh, authenticating to the card. The card was powered on at the same moment that the firmware booted and turned on the field. And. Uh, it's authenticating, reading, I can see the output, then I stop the capture, uh, read the, uh, get out the capture from, um, um, get the capture data, put it through my decoder, see which frames were transmitted, and return to step one, power off, power on, and so on. And this is why we are the first few of these transactions that I captured. I actually snipped out everything that's not the challenge response protocol. There's a mutual authentication protocol that's initiated, initiated by the reader. Then the card answers with its random number. That's 32 bits of randomness that are only 16 bit random. <laughs> the reader answers uh, with uh, second, uh, with um, challenge and response, something they claim they have implemented something based on ISO 9798-2, but that's actually not possible based on the length of these. That's standard mutual authentication. 
And then uh, that's challenge, response, new challenge, response. That's one possible interpretation. We don't know exactly, or at least I don't know, maybe Carson has some more insight. And what you see now is that if I do that a few times, switch everything off, switch it on, and as soon as it's switched on, or sometime, rel relatively fixed time after switching on, it will authenticate for the first time, you see that the card, uh, uh, card's random number generator somehow has a bad day and is outputting the same data over and over. Uh, I was kind of confused when I saw that earlier. I, was, I thought I had mixed up the files and was reading uh, decoding the wrong data set, but no, that was the correct data set. And what you also see, that's the card random number generator. What you also see is that the reader random number generator is also not such a good day. It's not as often as the card. It's not repeating itself as often because there's more time in between and there can be interrupts in the firmware that will delay the timing for a few microseconds and so on. But it's actually quite often that the reader will also have the same random sequence uh, over and over again. These were the first few, and then I have a collection of uh, 27 trials. It's actually quite uh, time-consuming, switching off and manually starting the capture in the Windows software with clicking and then stopping and clicking and exporting. It's not, can't be automated. So I took half an hour about to make these 27 trials. And then I grabbed out and set it and unique and whatever with a Unix pipeline, the mutual with authentication pairs and sorted them. And these are the random number ge numbers generated by the card and the first response by the reader. And it's sorted and every line is counted. And you see, this is our winner. This combination occurred six times in our 27 trials and most of the other ones occurred multiple times too. So that's basically the uh, random number and the challenge response is completely broken, not by us, but by design. But, but even if, if that weren't the case, 16-bit random numbers means you, you, you listen in on 128 transactions and then after an expected number of another 128, you see one of the challenges again. So without any control over the randomness here, you will break it in, in matters of minutes. Mm -hmm. And the, that's, uh, Carsten didn't mention that number before, 65,000 uh, 65, possible combinations at 9.44 microseconds per shifting means that the random number cycle repeats every 0 0.7 seconds. <laughs> Okay, and um, so basically we can control, I didn't, that's the interesting thing, thing, I didn't intentionally insert anything into the firmware to control the timing, it was, was just so by default. Um, if I had introduced some precise timing to not start the authentication procedure as early as possible, but at a specified time, I would have had the same uh, tuples over and over. And if you can control the timing, you, can, you have basically, for example, a replay attack. You listen to, a, to one transaction, and then you make that card send the same random number at gen again, and then can replay the reader side of the communication, and the card will do its uh, same responses over and over. And because the MyFair cards have a, a parse feature, you can designate sectors or blocks as a money, monetary value, and then have a transaction that not means write something to that sector, but increment the value in that sector by five euros, and you replay the increment transaction over and over, free lunch. There was another um, interesting thing, or much more interesting uh, breaking thing. Um, when I heard of Carsten's results, um, we were not quite sure how the initial state of the um, shift register of the, the cipher is set up. We don't know for exactly. 
but um, he said that there can't be, there are not enough inputs for unique identifier and key and all at the same time. So unique identifier and key must somehow be meshed together, mixed together uh, somewhere before that and put into the state. But we did see that there wasn't enough time for both to go in serially, what you would expect. So we knew they had to be merged in some way. And Henrik found genau. an excellent way of excellent. finding out. And that. then I just um, went ahead and um, just said, okay, if I flip the zeroth bit of the uh, unique identifier, um, which bit do I have to flip? If I flip the zeroth bit of the unique identifier and flip the zeroth bit of the key, does the authentication still work? The way that I did that is with modified firmware. You can't do that as an attack on an actual reader. I have modified firmware that just ignores the unique identifier that gets sent from the card, but uses its own unique identifier, uh, preset identifier, and it doesn't use the real key, but a modified key. And then I use modified unique identifier and modified key with a real card and a real key in the card. And so I just went on flipping. Flipping bit zero, flipping bit zero, success. One, one, success. Two, two, success. Three, three, success. Four, four, success. Five, five, no success. Hmm. Um, I flipped bit five in the UID and flipped, I tried every other bit in the key and there were, was no success. Then Carsten said, maybe it's two, I need two bits. Okay, I tried all combinations of two bits in the key. Uh, together with bit five in the unique identifier, and I had a success. Uh, five and zero, uh, bit five in the key, and bit five and zero in the unique identifier. Okay, um, let's increment that. Bit six in the key, bit one and six in the unique identifier, success. Seven, two, seven, success. Eight, three, eight, success. Nine, four, nine, no success. Now comes the cool part. Nine, four, nine, no success. I actually tried again the nine and every two bit combinations and didn't find any. So I tried three bit combinations. I started with four, nine, zero success. And then I noticed a strange scheme appearing because 10. One, five, ten. Uh, I, I noticed a strange theme appearing because if you look at these columns, you'll notice that if you represent bit zero, one, and then so on as a value, as some value, for example, in hexadecimal, you see one, two, four, eight, and twenty-one. And the interesting part is this cell is equal to that cell shifted by one every time. You see, two shifted left by one equals four. Four shifted left by one equals eight. Eight shifted left by one is one zero. Except for this line where a new bit needs to be flipped at position zero, so I need to or in a one. And that extends all the way down. I wrote a program which thus just did this um, try with uh, zero up there, um, go down here, notice that five, five won't work, so it tries five, five, zero. Uh, we'll then find this one and goes down, always shifting left until no success, then set the lowermost bit, least significant bit, and then store the new value and shift it left over and over. And that's what I came up, up to bit 31. That's the <laughs> most significant bit of the 32-bit unique identifier. Those bits need to be flipped in order to make everything work with bit 31 flipped in the key. And that's the complete uh, mixing of key and unique identifier. There are no untested combinations in here. I can, for every bit in the key that I want to flip, I can say which bits I need to flip in the unique identifier, and I can calculate that backwards for most of the bits in the unique, uh, for every bit in the unique, uh, yeah, for every bit below or equal 31 in the key, 
I know which bit I need to flip in the unique identifier. And for all bits in the unique identifier, I can calculate which bits I need to flip in the key. So <laughs> that's uh, completely cool. Because if I have two completely different cards, one with the un unique identifier x and one with the unique identifier y, and I can't change the unique identifiers, and key x, then I can calculate key y so that both cards will start with the same cipher state. I can calculate a key for this card so that it will behave just as if this card, just as if it was this card, despite it having a different unique identifier. I can spoof unique identifiers in the authentication procedure. And that's without any knowledge of the algorithm. That's just, uh, that's not even hardware hacking, that's just playing around in the firmware. And one possible possibility to use that is you need the card emulator, as the guy in the back asked, to spoof the anti-collision procedure and give it out a fake unique identifier. So the reader asks, give me your unique identifier. My emulator says unique identifier X. OK, the reader tries to authenticate using unique identifier X and key X. And I've specially prepared my card Y with the unique identifier that I can change and the key that I calculated for this card. And even though both of these are using different unique identifiers and keys, the mutual authentication will succeed and both will talk against, will talk with each other. And the reader is thinking that it talks to card X, but is actually talking to card Y. And that's cool because um, it's not quite improbable that you have this situation where you have a card with um, a key that you know. It could be the read key, but you don't know the write key. So you can take a second card where you know the write key, calculate a fitting read key, a fitting read key using this algorithm, and then you have a card that is completely controlled, whose contents are completely controlled by you, and the reader will talk happily with it and thinks it's talking to the original card, which you can't write to. And um, using this, you can spoof the unique identifier through, during authentication. For example, if you have, you don't, uh, if you want to uh, use an access control system and don't have the right unique identifier, and it's not only reading the unique identifier from the anti-collision, but also performing a mutual authentication because it's authentication, then you can uh, spoof that too. Um, the only thing that you can spoof with this uh, technique is the contents of sector zero. Con sector zero is write protected. You can't write to sector zero. And sector zero contains the unique identifier, another copy. So if the access control system would read the a um, unique identifier from sector zero, it, depending on how smart the programmer was, it could notice that something is wrong. Mm, you need another technique to, against that. For example, which we didn't mention at all until now, it's uh, common knowledge that you don't use stream ciphers and uh, CRC for um, method authentication. MIFA is using a stream cipher and CRC16 for method authentication. I, in principle, I can perform a relay attack and flip arbitrary bits in the, in the, while they are transferring over the air. That's the same problem that VEP had with the RC4 and CRC. So I, if I know the contents of the transmission, I can arbitrarily alter it and, for example, spoof the contents of sector zero if I have the equipment for that, which shouldn't be hard. Okay, but that's uh, a cool thing without any special equipment or not a lot of special equipment and completely breaks the UID and the authentication. And that's all I wanted to show you. And and the the lesson to take home from this slide is really to use unique keys for every user, even read keys, because every user can impersonate any other user using this attack. 
stuff. And those are the cards X and Y. I've, I've modified the key on that card so that the reader, when authenticating to the card, you, the reader authenticates to both cards just fine with the same unique identifier. I've set up the reader to use a fixed identifier and not use the anti-collision, and it will authenticate to both cards and not notice any difference. Okay. Thanks does a lot. Work in, does it work in practice? More questions? Ah, in the back. Hi. These, uh, these questions aren't for me. They're from a cryptographer by the name of David Molnar, who wishes he could be here, but unfortunately is stuck in Las Vegas. Um, one is, do you plan to try this on the Oyster card? Which, um? Do you plan to try this on the Oyster card? No, we don't have any Oyster card. Um, what, what, what technology is used in those? They're, they're my fair cards. Yeah, I know they're my well, fair cards. we broke I've, the Oyster card I've, then. I've, yes. So I've it would be nice if, uh, if perhaps you, uh, when you release this, you could send him an email. And the second thing is, thoughts on building a secure cipher with similar gate budgets? Pardon? What thoughts you might have on building a secure cipher with similar gate budgets? Well, the Philips themselves, they, they now build in the same area budget with a lot more gates, the DES, which is a 30-year-old crypto, and that seems the, the only standardized crypto that does fit on an RFID tag. But we, we might need to start talking about sacrificing some cryptographic properties to, to, to come up with new primitives that would actually fit on RFID tags better, that are custom tailored basically to RFID applications. Um, so Jake, to answer that question. Um, there was a bunch of um, cryptographers designing a low um, gauge um, cipher based on this, which is called Present 80, if I remember correctly. Um, those were a couple of people from Bochum and Lars Knudsen, some people from England. It was a ra rather large team. And this is currently being evaluated for RFIDs. Um, as far as I know, there are no attacks that break the whole cipher yet. So it's 32 rounds. It's a fairly large... Um, number of rounds is a block cipher. Um, I think the best attack, which is unpublished so far, is um, 15 or 16 rounds. And that has, so the, the cipher is aiming for 2 to the 80 security. And I think the best attack right now has 2 to the 75, so that's theoretical still. Is, is that the, the DS based cipher that uses only one S box? No, no, that is, so this, this, um, the, the, this one cipher that uses just one S box. This is a predecessor of that. This was, okay. I think, a diploma thesis by one of Christoph Parr's students. And present 80 is basically following that line of research um, with lots of people who are very knowledgeable in this area and who have looked upon this. Yeah, and, and that's I, exactly the right route to take, to have other people look at it before you sell it as advanced security levels. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, those guys really know what they're doing, but it's still, I mean, it, it still might get broken. So we have to mm -hmm. wait, like, the next five or ten years and see what happens. If we can, if, if you can't use um, the triple DES or AES, that's, I think, the next best shot that you have. Okay, thanks for those comments. Any more questions? We have a few minutes left. Okay. Well, That's fine. Thank you very much for your attention this last session. <laughs>